I testify that there is no true God except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And being the true God means he's the only one that deserves our worship. He is alone. He's peerless. He has no partners. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I testify that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and messenger. Brothers and sisters in Islam. This crisis that we are dealing with, this pandemic, reminds me of something that we should never neglect. That is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kalla inna al insana layatwa arraahu stagna inna ila rabbika al muntaha inna ila rabbika al ruja'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah azza wa jal says in, the, in these ayat, inna al insana layatwa that mankind yatwa. From a Turyan, he transgresses, oppresses, oppresses himself, oppresses other people. He goes beyond the limits that have been set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When does man do that? When he believes that he is independent, when he believes that he is free of need, he doesn't need God anymore. Why? Because he has science and he has the latest medical, uh, technological advancements and he has everything. So he doesn't need Allah. We don't need God anymore. We have science. We have all of these other great things. <inaudible> when he believes that he is free of need. Why would he answer to a higher power? If he has everything that he needs and he got there without answering to that higher power, he got all of the material benefits of this world without obeying the law. So why would he continue to obey Allah? He thinks he's free of need. <inaudible> but to your Lord, you will return. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us return to him in this life before that ultimate return to him in the next life. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that we are in fact weak, that we are fragile. We, the collective we, as humankind, no matter how advanced we get, we are in fact weak and we're fragile. Ya ayyuha nas, antumul fuqara'u ila Allah, wallahu huwa al-ghaniyul hamid. O oh, mankind, you are fuqara in Allah. You are poor. You are in need of Allah. And Allah is al ghani He is inherently rich, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has no need of anything of his creation. And he is Al-Hamid, the one who is worthy of all praise. If there's nothing that we get out of, of calamity and affliction and pandemics, except that we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala genuinely seeking his aid, making our bond with him stronger, then the pandemic has done its job. And as Muslims, we don't process information the same way that people who don't believe in Allah process information. We believe that ultimately this life is temporary anyway. And it's a test for us to see how we will respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. We can't control his decree. We don't control our own destiny as some people would have us believe. Motivational speakers and inspirational speakers and other, you control your destiny. So when things go wrong, we all break down because we think it's something that we've done. Maybe I didn't try hard enough. No, no. These things are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No doubt our response to calamity is, is what our test is. How we deal with these problems when they come is what our test is. But we can't prevent the problems from coming. Nobody had the power to prevent what has happened to us from happening. And so... 
I want to, in this khutbah, just draw some light on how we should, as Muslims, be responding to what's happening right now. And, and brothers, let, let me make it very clear that we are at the beginning of this crisis, not in the middle. This, you know, subhanAllah, 10 days ago, 10 days ago, there were approximately 4,000, you know, known cases in the United States of America. Today, that number is over 85,000. We surpassed everybody else in the world, including China, which has four times the population of the United States. And guess what? Those numbers are only going to increase as the testing increases. The reality is, is that people have it and don't really know that they have it. And so we're at the beginning of this pandemic. Even though, you know, we've been talking about it for two weeks, maybe. And our masjids have been severely affected, as, as all of you know. But being at the beginning means that we have to do our best to curb the spread of this pandemic. That we have a responsibility as Muslims to our society as a whole. And believe me, believe me, this is not something that is specific to any faith. The pandemic doesn't discriminate. In New York City, subhanAllah, there's a community of Muslims, many of them live in the same apartment complex. As of yesterday, 60 of them in the same apartment complex have all tested positive for COVID-19. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and to protect all of those who believe in him and worship him alone. Amen. So that being said, when, when we realize that, that there's a lot of damage being done, that there's destruction, that this disease is deadly, that it is contagious, highly contagious, highly transmissible, then what do we do? What do we do as Muslims? Number one, brothers and sisters in Islam, I'd like to mention here, is that we have to slow down, not panic, process the information. Slow down. Don't panic. Process the information. The believer always recognizes that there is a silver lining to whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. Allah azza wa jal tells us in the Quran, inna ma'al usri yusra. Inna ma'al usri yusra. That with the difficulty, there is ease. With that difficulty, the same one, there is even more ease. No matter what difficulty we're dealing with in life, there's always more ease than there is difficulty. And this is important because how we process information has everything to do with our ability to be happy. SubhanAllah, there was a course uh, many years ago run called the Science of Happiness or something along these lines. It was the most well-attended course ever at Harvard University. And the professor there boiled it down to this. How you process information will depend on how happy or not you are. So when we look at this, what's happening right now, uh, we've got stay-at-home orders. Our movement is restricted. This is the weirdest Jumu'ah, if I can use that term lightly. This is the weirdest Jumu'ah I've ever attended in my life. These are unprecedented times that we're going through. Yani, subhanAllah, the fact that the houses of Allah across the globe, in general, I'm not saying every single one, but that they have closed down is something that is absolutely unprecedented in the history of Islam. We're so we're dealing, with some, we're dealing with some tough times, no doubt about it. The economy, I don't think we even realize how hard our economy has been hit. In, in, in 2007, 2008, when there was the global economic, uh, you know, uh, epidemic, if you will, crisis, it took over three years for things to get back to normal. 
you know, right now we're dealing with something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Airlines shut down, hotel industry shut down, restaurants are being shut down, the gig economy is shut down. What is that going to mean long term? We don't know. But guess what? But guess what? As Muslims, we realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. And we have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he will bring us out of this. He is our Rabb subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our caretaker. He is our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our nurturer and sustainer. And so we have confidence in that. And we have to. The way that we process this information, let's look at some of the other things. People now have spent more time with their family in the last two weeks than they probably spent in the last two years. Not two months, but two years. You know, it has given us the opportunity for those, for those who can see that the glass is half full. It's given us the opportunity to appreciate our family. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appreciated his family. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spent time with his family. He spent time in the house helping Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and helping his other wives. He appreciated the fact that he had family. There's some of us who don't have that. They're stuck in isolation for real, meaning there's no one else around them. But when we, you know, we look at these times, we look at the fact that Bars are closed. That's a good thing. Alhamdulillah. Casinos are closed. That's a great thing. Alhamdulillah. Interest rates are at zero. That's Islam. <laughs> we, we look at the fact that there is a lot of good that has come out of, of this pandemic. Now, the question that I want you to just stick in your minds for right now, we'll come back to it later, inshallah. What change are you going to make during this pandemic that will be a permanent change for the better? Bismillah. Because we've all gotten a chance to slow down a little bit. We've all gotten a chance to think a little bit more. What are we going to do? What changes are we going to start making now that will be permanent changes for the better? So, so this is number one, that we need to slow down, not panic, and process this information. Process it, yes. We recognize that this is a huge trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a fitna, it's a, it's a tribulation, it's balat. Yani it, it is a punishment for some people, but it's a mercy also for the believers. And, and we have to be able to process it that way. The second thing that is very important for us to understand is the concept of tawakkul and how we put all of this together. Okay? Allah says, he instructs us in the Quran, he says, قُلْ لَنْ يُسِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا هُوَ مَوْلَانَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, say, nothing will happen to us except what Allah has written. We believe that as Muslims. If I or you or someone else is decreed to walk out of this thing free, from no disease, then that is already written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though I may come into contact with a whole bunch of people who have, who have the pandemic, who, who have the the, the, the illness. Okay? And subhanAllah, I may have practiced all of the practices that, that they recommend by washing my hands every, you know, so often using the, uh, the, uh, the hand sanitizer, social distancing, not mixing, and it, it may still wind up with the, with the illness. Only what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written, that's, that's the only thing that's going to happen to us. Who are Mawlana? Allah is our guardian. He is our Mawlana, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our protector. And he is our wali, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And upon Allah, let the believers put their trust. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, put your trust. Upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rely. Put your reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this, brothers and sisters in Islam, is a very important concept. I don't want us to, to miss it. What does it mean that you put your trust in Allah? Unfortunately, we see too many believers who think that it means to abandon reason, to abandon the practices that protect us. Our Prophet ﷺ was the best one who ever put his trust in Allah. 
When he went to Mecca, even though there was a presumption that there wasn't going to be fighting, I'm in fact, when they went into Mecca, Prophet Sallallahu had his armor on, he had his helmet on. And he wasn't going around saying to people, why do I need it? Yeah, it's a, it's, there's a war, but why do I need armor and why do I need a helmet? Allah protects me. Yes, Allah will protect you, but Allah which has also instructed us to take means. The same one who said, while Allah fell al mu'minun, and upon, in, in Allah put your trust, the same one who said that said, Khudu hidrakum, take your precautions. Allah said that, and He said that. Our Prophet alayhi salatu was said, in a famous hadith, he says, La adwa wa la tiyara to the end of the hadith. Very beginning of the hadith is what I want to focus on. He says, La adwa. There is no, nothing that is contagious. What? What does that mean? What the Prophet وسلم, is telling us here is that there is no contagion that acts on its own. That the things only spread from one person to another person by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are not independent actors, independent agents. They only act by the will of Allah. La adwa. So there is nothing that independently can go from one place to another place, infect this person and then that person, except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that. And then what did the Prophet Sallallahu say at the end of that same hadith? Same hadith, where he says that none of that happens except for the will of Allah? He then said, وَفِرَّ مِنَ الْمَجْدُومِ كَمَا تَفِرُّ مِنَ الْأَسْرِ And run away from the one who is majdum, yani the one who has leprosy, which is, a, which is an infectious disease. Run away from him the way that you would run away from a lion. Okay, if we're saying that there's nothing contagious, that can act on its own, then why would I run away? You run away because you have to take the means. You do. So the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us here to rely upon the creator of the means and the methods. Don't rely upon the means and the methods, but use them. Use them, but don't rely upon them. So we have our i'tiqad. We have our belief as Muslims, and our practices are surrounded or our practices are based on those beliefs. Very important concept for us to understand because many of us are taking this thing too lightly. And we have extremes. We have people that are, that are absolutely hysterical. They lock themselves in a room, they don't want to see their own families, put, put the food under the door. I mean, just absolute hysteria. And then we have people who act like it's business as usual. Today is just like yesterday, and it's not. It's really not. And this is not just some, uh, even if this is, you know, we want to go with conspiracy theories and things like that. The reality is that's, that has nothing to do with what the reality is today. If this was a conspiracy theory for, I mean, if this was a conspiracy to control populations and so on and so forth, whatever it might have started as, it is what it is today. And, and we have to deal with the reality of today. So it's very important for us also to recognize that our tawakkul, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not negate us doing those things that the professionals in their fields are recommending that we do. However, brothers in Islam, and this is the point that we want to make today in this khutbah, is that all of those means that are being talked about are physical means. Washing your hands, using hand sanitizer, staying a certain distance, coughing in the crook of your arm, uh, uh, self-isolating or quarantining until the end of it. These are physical means. Nobody except for a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to remind you of divine protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As believers, we, again, don't process things the same way that other people process it. And therefore, we have to seek protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from something that is far more dangerous than COVID-19. Pay attention here. What is far more dangerous than COVID-19 and what has crippled more people globally than COVID-19 is the fear of COVID-19. It's the fear. It is the anxiety. 
that comes with a global pandemic. How is it that we fight this fear or we protect ourselves from this fear? And, and, and I, I'm not talking about taking precautions. We, we already said that we have to take our precautions. But how do we keep ourselves from panicking? There's only one way, and that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide your heart. It's, it's for you to allow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide your heart. You have to get out of the way and turn your affair over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This fear and this anxiety, the same way that every illness has symptoms, right? When we talk about what we're dealing with today, the COVID-19, and talking about the fever and the dry cough and the other things that are associated, these are symptoms, but there's an underlying illness. Fear and anxiety are symptoms. The underlying illness is that we don't have enough trust in Allah. Mm. The underlying illness is that we're not really sure whether Allah is our rub. Is he, he really our caretaker? We don't have that confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove from us the affliction or to decree what's best for us, even if that means that we're afflicted with the illness. And so what I want to do is I want you to consider some prophetic advice. And I, I know that this khutbah is a little longer than the, than the normal ones. But, but it's important for us right now. These are extreme circumstances, uh, and so they call for extreme measures, if you will. So khutbah is a little longer than it normally is. But I want us to understand this prophetic advice, because bi-idnillahi ta'ala, it will begin to cure us. It will begin the healing process that we all need. I, I don't care how much knowledge we have, how, how long you've been a Muslim, we all need this healing. We all need this advice from the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, advice I'm going to give today from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is so important that the great scholar of Islam, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, said that we are more in need of this advice that I'm going to give you today. We are more in need of it than we are in need of air, food, drink, and clothing. Now imagine that. Listen to this hadith. Abdullah ibn Khubayr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, we went out on a dark, rainy night, looking for the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, to lead us in prayer. Presumably what happened was, because it was dark and rainy, they didn't pray in the masjid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So they went out, looking for the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And once they finally found the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet asked Abdullah bin Khubayb Asallaytum, did you all pray? And he said, I didn't respond. I didn't respond. Now the scholars of Hadith say that he didn't know how to, what, what to say to the Prophet Alaihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Maybe I should tell him we didn't pray because we want you to pray with us, or maybe it's a little late, so we should have prayed. So he didn't really know how to respond. Then the Prophet والسلام, said to him, Qul, say. Abdullah said, I didn't respond. I didn't, I didn't say anything. He said, the Prophet وسلم, said it again. Qul, say. He said, I didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. I didn't respond. Then the Prophet وسلم, the third time said, Qul, say. And Abdullah ibn Khubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, Ma akul. What is it, O Messenger of Allah, that I should say? So the Prophet وسلم, said, Qul, Qul, hu Allahu ahad wal mu'awwidatayn hina tumsi wa hina tusbih thalatha marrat takfika min kulli shay. The Prophet وسلم, said, Say, Qul, hu Allahu ahad. That is, Surah Al Ikhlas. And the Mu'awi the Tain, the two surahs in which you seek refuge, meaning Surah Al Falaq and Surah Al Nas. So the last three chapters of the Quran. Three times in the evening and three times in the morning. Listen to this. This is our Prophet, and he does not speak from his own desires. He said, Takfika min kulli shay. 
they will suffice you in all respects. In other words, they will protect you from everything, both physical harms, metaphysical harms, things that you can see and things you can't see. They will protect you from anxiety. They will protect you from fear. They will protect you from being stung by a poisonous insect or animal. They will protect you from everything the Prophet Wasallam said. Brothers in Islam, this is significant. Three times in the morning and three times in the evening. Guess what? Almost every Muslim on planet Earth knows those surahs. These, these are not like the middle surahs in the Quran. Almost everybody knows these surahs. But are we taking this advice of the Prophet Sallallahu to say them three times in the morning and three times in the evening, understanding what it is that we are reciting? And that's why I want to go over briefly what these sorters mean, because they will protect you, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, from both external threats and the internal threat. And that is what a lot of people don't recognize when reciting these surahs. So I'm going to start with Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. Surah Al-Falaq, you start by saying, Qul a'udhu bi Rabbil Falaq. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the Falaq, which is daybreak. We always say, I seek refuge, but what does that really mean? Do we, when we say a'udhu, are we really conscious that we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for shelter? Like a refugee that shows up on the border. He's running away from something that he fears. Whether it's political persecution. Whether it's poverty. Whatever it is that he fears in that land that he's in. He shows up on the border. He's a refugee. He is seeking what? Refuge. He wants protection from something that he fears. So when we seek, when we say, A'udhu bi Rabbil Falaq. We are seeking the protection of the Lord of daybreak, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from something that we fear. We are seeking his shelter. We're turning to him. We're running away from something that we fear and seeking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And if Allah is with protects you, wallahi, you don't need anybody else's protection or promises. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ from all of the evil that is created. Because from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes evil things. And then there are three things that are mentioned specifically. From the darkness as it spreads. From the darkness as it spreads. Now look at, look at that. What normally happens in any society, crime, and think about it, is higher in the daytime or in the nighttime. It's higher in the night. People like the cover, not just people. They like the cover of darkness, the cover of darkness to do their dirt, to do their criminal activity. And some people are just scared of the dark, as it is. So you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of daybreak, the one who is going to bring you day after night. After that darkness spreads, it is Allah who is the Rabbul Falaq who is going to bring about daybreak. And so he's going to remove that physical darkness that overcomes just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes darkness from our hearts. He removes darkness from our eyes because we're in a dark time right now, but there's light at the end of the tunnel for those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives light. And whoever Allah doesn't give light, then he will have no light. But Allah Azza wa Jal gives us light and he guides us through our iman in him. Those who believe in Allah and do righteous deeds, Allah will guide them through their iman. Because of their faith, Allah Azza wa Jal will, will guide them. He guides them through that. So Allah Azza wa Jal brings guidance. He brings light after darkness. He is Rabbul Falaq. 
You seek refuge in Allah. Rabbil Falak, from these things, from the darkness as it spreads, from the sorceresses, those people who are practicing sorcery, and that is real and it has effects. So you're seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from those who practice it and from the sorcery itself and from its, its evil effects. And from the hasid, the one who envies as he is envying. Now all of these, Ikhwan, look at these things. These things are threats that come from the outside. Whether it's darkness and the criminals that do their dirt during the darkness, whether it is somebody who is trying to affect you through sorcery, whether it is hasid and envy and so all of these are external threats. We seek refuge with Rabbil Falaq. Now look at this. Well, as we move, Qul a'udhu bi Rabbil Nas. I seek refuge in Rabbil Nas. The one who is what? The Lord and the sustainer and the cherisher and the caretaker of all of mankind. But I didn't stop there. Malik Nas, the one who is the sovereign. He is the king and master of mankind as a whole. And he is Ilah Nas, the true God of mankind. So here, I'm seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using these.